Um, again, welcome to the day of Pentecost. I'm so excited to be with you. Um, this is really the culmination of the Easter se- season for us. Uh, so rather than seeing it as an immediate transition to some other subject, we actually see it as the culmination of 50 days of celebrating this new life that we have in Christ. And here we are on the 50th day of the Easter season known as Pentecost. Um, Jesus has passed the baton to, to the apostles. And he said, as the Father sent me, so now I am sending you. He passes the baton. And he says, and then you will go, you will get on the move, and you will be my witnesses from Jerusalem, starting right here in your hometown with your own, you know, your peeps. You know these people. You're going to start here, but then you're going to work your way out way beyond your comfort zone, and you're going to get all the way out to the uttermost parts of the earth. And my question in this series we've been in over seven weeks now in Eastertide that's entitled On the Move is, how would they get on the move? Did you know that Jesus said these words to a group of apostles, men particularly, who were behind locked doors, hunkered down after his death and resurrection? They are like the epitome of like, we're not going to break this little holy huddle we, we got going here. Like, we're afraid to even go outside. And Jesus says, you're going to be my witnesses. How? How would they get on the move? How would they go from Jerusalem to the uttermost parts of the earth? How would they go? How would Peter go from being so flaky, so up one moment, so down the next, to being totally rock solid and steady? I want to contend that it's not because he would learn more or know more. It's not because he's going to try harder or they're going to try harder. They didn't need more effort. They didn't even need better precepts. They needed new power. And what happens in Acts 2 is God supplies the person and work of the Holy Spirit in a new and profound way. We know it as Pentecost. They didn't have a principle or an effort shortage. They had a power shortage. How would they go from being this huddled group to being on the move as they would get miraculous, supernatural filling from on high? Jesus' promise, he had promised it. He said, just stay in Jerusalem and wait. Wait. And then I will send another that is just like me and he will fill you and will clothe you with power from on high. Wow, what an amazing promise. Um. So happy birthday, Church of the Resurrection. Check out these banners. Aren't those awesome? Brenda Gribben, one of the local artists here in Flower Mound and a member of our church, designed these for us. They'll be up throughout uh, our series in the book of Mark as we look and see um, how Jesus indeed trained his disciples to be on the move. Um, Today, as we look at this, I want you to see uh, a couple things about this miraculous new birth that happens. You see, Luke is the writer of the book of Luke, it's duh, I know duh, but he also wrote the book of Acts. And he, he, he intends for us to hold both of these up. And in Luke 1 and 2, he tells them of a miraculous birth, doesn't he? You know the miraculous birth that's talked about in the Bible, even if you don't know the Bible. It's the virgin birth. It's Mary and Jesus. Nobody worked up enough energy and effort to figure out how the incarnate God would become man, right? No, no human ingenuity solved that. Power had to come in from outside, from on high. And Luke tells of this miracle, and then he wants us to hold up another miraculous birth. And it's your birth, and it's my birth. It's the birth of the church, and it is miraculous. It is, it is a promise that comes from beyond ourselves, My favorite illustration for this, some of you might be annoyed because I say it every Pentecost Sunday, listen, I can't remember what I preached last week, so uh, to share an illustration, this is a profoundly rich metaphor, and so I'm going to share it again. Um, You may know it as the intertropical convergence zone. It's this little geographical space near the equator. It's commonly known in the sailing world as the doldrums. 
It's a place where uh, the air can actually get so calm that in a time and in a season when the only way to power a vessel across open water is wind, to be stuck in the intertropical convergence zone is not just a matter of like just, you know, not having fun or it kind of sort of spoiling your vacation. It's a matter of life and death. Sailors would call it the doldrums because of the low spirits they and the entire crew would experience when you're just stuck out in open water with no wind. And when I look back on my life, when I look at many people in their lives right now after the last year and a half that we've had, we inevitably get stuck in the doldrums, don't we? We get stuck in this place where it's like, man, we're not, we're not moving. You ever felt stuck? Like you just, you got no power. You can't figure it out. Whatever it is, what do you do when there's no wind in your sails? What most of us do is we try harder. Uh, We double down our own energy and effort. What happens when a marriage gets stuck in the doldrums? Our minds, our bodies, our relationships, entire movements, churches get stuck in the doldrums, and you look up at the sail and you go, "Mm, this boat isn't going anywhere. What do we do when we're stuck, when there's no wind? I I, I sort of imagine myself over my life of following Christ, sometimes looking at this great big sail and with my own lungs trying to blow wind into my sails. That's not how it works. You can't figure it out. Peter, the other apostles couldn't figure it out. Um, something has to happen from the outside. Some, Some other power, some other wind, some other promise has to come and fill, fill the sail of our lives. And so Jesus promised this, that if we would receive the gift, he actually, in one occasion, did you know he physically blew on the apostles? That's kind of a unique moment. Um, He said, receive the gift of the Spirit, and he blew on them. You remember any other time in the Scripture where somebody blows their breath into a human being? This is in Genesis. What's happening? What is Jesus doing? New new creation. New life. A miraculous birth. He's breathing on his disciples. Now, how do we receive that breath, that wind? He actually talked about the Holy Spirit as a wind, a mighty rushing wind. And what we just heard read in Acts 2 is that a mighty rushing wind, that was the sound they heard, came and it filled them and it filled the whole room. And I want us to spend a few minutes here Uh, This will sound familiar to some of you if you've listened to my teaching and preaching over the last eight years, but there's a few nuances here that are quite different. Uh, We are constantly learning and growing, aren't we? I want to talk about three postures and three priorities that parallel the posture, okay? Open hands, bended knees, and diligent feet. These are the three postures. I'm not going to be gimmicky. It sounds gimmicky. I'm not trying to be gimmicky. This is not, God is not somebody that you can manipulate and control, The Holy Spirit goes wherever he wills, doesn't he? And yet, what we see in Scripture, what we see in the church is that he goes where he is wanted. These are three practices that train our desires, that train our wanters to want the right things. Here's the first one, open hands. So open hands, and this is the priority of getting neutral. I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. They ask him at the beginning of this whole story in Acts 1, are you now going to do the thing that we thought you were going to do, which is restore the kingdom of Israel and set up a nation state and make us sort of the rulers and get Rome out of the way? Are you now going to do that? And Jesus says, it's not for you to know the time, but you will receive power. You will be my witnesses. Um, Just wait in Jerusalem. Now, here's what the disciples would quickly learn is that their expectations of how this is going to go are probably going to be disrupted. And they are going to be constantly surprised at how God's going to work in their lives. This means that to be the recipient of this mighty rushing wind, it means that you and I have to to loosen up our grip on what we think our lives are supposed to look like and how things are supposed to go. God does not have some other life 
for you to consider what it would mean to put in front of him. It's your life. It's the ordinary challenges that are right in front of you. So what is it in your life that you are currently holding on to with just white-knuckled grip? Something that you are having a very hard time letting go of. Uh, the language that really resonates with me, a friend gave me a book that helped me to find this language, is getting neutral. You have to get to the place where you're truly open. God, whatever you want to do with this career, this job, this relocation, this challenge, this conflict, God, whatever you want to do, it is yours. You want the Holy Spirit to come and fill the cells of your life? You got to loosen up the grip on the ordinary material that's right in front of you. And as you loosen up that grip, as you put that before the Lord, you will see him begin to move in and take control in profound ways. Open hands. Um, This takes time to learn, but I assure you, it's not a gimmick. It's not a tactic to manipulate God. It's a way of saying, to put yourself in the posture of saying, Lord, come and fill me. I don't want to live just as I've been living. you got to loosen up your grip on the way you think things should go. Do you have open hands? It doesn't matter what order. I'm not, again, this isn't a gimmick. This isn't like a a self-help sermon. It's the opposite of that. I just want us to capture it. So, So open hands. The second, the priority there with open hands is we get to neutral. We're open to whatever God wants to have happen. The second posture is bended knees. Acts 2, 1 says they were all together in one place. Uh, What we're going to see is that the church had this pattern um, of of a deep commitment and priority to prayer. Over the next six weeks, after today, we are going to walk through a series in Mark about the pace of being on the move with Jesus. And I want you to know the priority here is, is withness. Not witness, withness. He intends for you to be in conversation with him about the challenges that you're facing and we're facing. The priority here as we bend the knee in prayer and conversation with God is to say that he really wants us to be with him as we walk through this life. He actually called his disciples, this is really next week's sermon and the six weeks after, but he called his disciples to him that they might be Yeah, it's not that well known. With him. With him. Bended knees in prayer. Um, He knows what you're facing. But it's amazing to me how how long it takes me. Maybe I'm the only one that's slow to this in the room. But I oftentimes will try harder. I'll try to learn more. And then finally some great spiritual friend will be alongside me with their arm around me. And they'll say, hey, have you talked to Jesus about it yet? Oh, that's right. Uh, It's not a last resort. It's not, well, all we can do is pray. No, no, it's a life bathed in prayer in conversation with God. It's a priority that we see as we study the book of Acts, as we look at how the Lord came in power. And because of sin in our lives, it always includes some confession and repentance. Uh, We start every service, actually, with an acknowledgement that God sees everything He knows everything, and we're a mess. Now, liturgical, sacred language, it goes more like this. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open. All desires are known. From you no secrets are hidden. You know everything about us, and we are a mess. So come and cleanse. What does this have to do with Acts 2? Everything. Because here they are in the middle of this There's 120, I don't know, we didn't count, but we're probably close to that. Here we are, Pentecost, the church on Sunday. That's about how many were gathered. And then what happens is Peter gets up later in the passage that we only heard the first 11 verses, and he preaches. And he puts a finger right in the chest of the Jewish people in Jerusalem. Here's the starting point. You will be my witnesses. It's going to start with the very people that are the most difficult because they're so like you, and you're so like them. And he puts his finger right in the chest and he says, you crucified him. Now, 
it's kind of an interesting sermon. We didn't have to, it's like 40 something verses. We didn't read all of it. But at the end of it, it's the best response any preacher could ever ask for. Because they go, what should we do? We hear you. What should we do? And Peter says, repent. Turn, turn from your sin. This conversation with God, this honest, real, genuine, candid conversation includes prayer conversation about the daily, ordinary events that we're facing in life as we bend the knee. And it also concludes regular, regular, multiple times a day probably, moments of confession and repentance. What makes the sail on the ship go up our hands that are open, knees that are bent. And Jesus said in the gospel reading, whatever you ask in my name, this will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. What a promise that Jesus has attached to the prayers of the church according to his will and guidance. Open hands, bended knee. The last one is diligent feet. Um. You know those, uh, when you walk into a sporting goods store, they have those huge mannequins. Uh, I've sort of envisioned like three postures. Um, Hands that are open, knees that are bent, but then feet that are diligent. This actually becomes a qualification for leaders in the church in the New Testament, by the way. The word for it is in spude. It means diligent feet. It means feet that are serious about mission. If the priority of bended knees is withness, The priority of feet that are diligent is mission. And we are serious about living beyond ourselves, not just living for ourselves, but being on mission. Now, I want you to make the connection before I close between the promise of the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit, and the mission of God in the world. So, Jesus says to them, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he said this, what does he do next? As the Father has sent me, so I send you. The very next thing Jesus does is he breathes on them. And he says, receive the Holy Spirit. Do you know what Pentecost actually was a celebration of? 50th day of the Passover celebration. Did you know this was a harvest celebration? That it it was a harvest celebration. that, That God had provided. That there was abundantly more. This is now no longer just a celebration of physical wheat or of physical lambs, but it's a harvest of spiritual wheat. The mark of Pentecost is mission. What happens here is that God gifts and births a church that's not only indwelled with his presence, which is amazing. Um, We have assurance before God that we are sons and daughters, sealed forever, Tremendous personal and communal promises are ours because of this gift of the Holy Spirit. But it's not just for us. What happens here is immediately 120 goes to 3,000. Wow. There's a multiplication that happens. And they now are going to get on the move. Isn't it interesting? We, kinda, we, we did sort of a Star Wars series this Eastertide. We started here and then now we're coming back. We're telling it backwards. Indeed, we know where things are going. Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Peter and Cornelius' house. These are passages we've looked at over the last seven weeks. But here's where it starts. The gift, speaking in languages that were not even their own. For what purpose? That the glory of God would be known on every shore. That every tribe and tongue would proclaim his praises. Are our feet diligent in mission? You see, the blessing of God's presence not only brings this personal peace and restfulness, but a church that is empowered in mission. These aren't just private. I've sort of tried to personalize them, but they're not just private, personal practices. In fact, our culture, we're so individualistic, you might think, okay, well, how am I going to get the sale of my own little life up? And there is a, there is a personal application here, but it's not private. The kind of shift that we're talking about is not a, your little life raft. It's a communal reality called the church that you and I have been grafted into. And the way that the sail goes up is a church whose hands are open and a church whose knees are bent and a church people, body, community, whose feet are diligent in mission together. And of all things, it includes stacking chairs 
It includes financial reports. It includes travel to foreign places to preach. It includes loving your neighbor. It's so ordinary. It's so ordinary that if you're not careful, you'll miss it. You'll miss that you're part of the crew, that you're aboard a ship, and that God wants the sails to not only be up, but to be full. This last year, we know, it's not just pastors that know, you know and I know, that many people are giving up on the church. Sometimes it's because the church has become so institutionalistic that it no longer resembles the body of Christ. And okay, that's a problem. But, but so many have thrown in the towel on this great ship, this great thing that Christ has given birth to in the Holy Spirit. There's an old quote that I keep coming back to. It's a, a writer named J.F. Powers that was a novelist. And he wrote in a novel, Wheat That Springeth Green, he used this metaphor of the ship. I want to share this with you. He's talking about the church, and he says, this is a big old ship, Bill. She creaks, she rocks, she rolls, and at times she makes you want to throw up. But she gets where she's going, always has, always will, until the end of time, with or without you. I want to invite you, as we think about these three practices and these three priorities that you not give up on the community that is God's people, the church. Now that is a universal, global, historic ship. That's way bigger than just what we're a part of here at Resurrection. That you not give up on, you know, sometimes the church will make you want to throw up. It's true. Don't give up on her. This sail is a communal sail, and we don't fill it. That's God's job. We don't fill it. We don't, with our shared lungs, try to empower it. But we do put our lives before him with open hands, bended knees, and diligent feet and say, come Holy Spirit. Let's pray together. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, would you do that which only you can do? Would you fill the cell of our life as your people? Lord, we want to be on mission with you. God, we want our hands to be open to your glory and not our own. But Lord, we're, we're weak, and so we need your grace. Lord, we need your power from on high. Would you clothe your church? We ask this for your name and for your glory. Amen.